RPM Act and its prospects for 2017. My name is Steve McDonald. I'm seen as Vice President of Government Affairs. I'm joined by my colleague Stuart Gosswine and our General Counsel, Trustee. We're going to provide a brief update on the legislation and then we'll take your questions. As many of you are aware, for the past year, the racing industry has joined forces to overturn a policy outlined in 2015 by the EPA that has given the agency the authority to regulate race parts. Uh, under previous interpretations of law, they did not have that uh, authority. So we're seeking to rescind the new policy by passing a bill in Congress called the Recognizing the Protection of Motorsports Act, better known as the RPM Act. I'm pleased to report that since the legislation was introduced in Congress last March, the bill has gained widespread, widespread bipartisan support. We currently have 120 sponsors in the House and 28 sponsors in the Senate. As we meet here today, the Congress is wrapping up business in Washington. They're likely to adjourn tomorrow, I think, tomorrow afternoon. And um, so we're also uh, announcing as well that we've put together a letter as an industry coalition full of all of the sister organizations and other race-oriented uh, groups. We've sent a letter to Vice President-elect Mike Pence. He's the chair of the transition team. We want to let him aware, make him aware of the issue and then uh, ask if he could agree to work with us uh, and with the new administration as we move forward. A copy of the letter to, Senate, to Governor Pence is in your, your press packets. Um, we're also in the process of working with the bill sponsors to introduce, have the bill introduced early in 2017. We believe this is an important opportunity for the newly elected Trump administration and the Congress to show that Washington can actually work effectively together to protect American manufacturing businesses. As I mentioned earlier, we have currently have 148 House and Senate bill sponsors for the bill. 11 members were not re-elected, um, but we believe there will be increasing support, and we hope that the bill will receive early consideration by Congress uh, when they convene in January. Racing isn't a partisan issue, it's an American tradition. It happens in every state and virtually every congressional district. Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have joined together to protect the sport along with the constituents' jobs and ability to purchase parts. The RPM Act is the necessary vehicle to protect racing now into the future. I'll turn it over to Stuart to give you a little bit more details about the RPM bill. Thank you, Steve. And the issue surrounding the EPA's action is really simple. Does the agency have the right to regulate race cars and race parts? Until 2015, the answer was really very clear, no. The reason was simple. Lawmakers understand that race car emissions are fairly minimal. And in fact, race tracks are the test labs for high performance parts. And that technology, as we know, eventually is incorporated into products that are found on highway vehicles. And this is a huge public benefit. In 1970, the Clean Air Act was enacted and the law had a definition of motor vehicle and defined motor vehicle as a car, truck, motorcycle used on public roadways. The definition did not apply to dedicated race cars since they are not used on the highways. Fast forward to 2015, the EPA announced that the Clean Air Act exemption only applies to purpose-built race vehicles like NASCAR, Formula One, dragsters, and sprint cars. The EPA contends the Clean Air Act exemption does not apply to converted motor vehicles. According to the EPA, it's always been illegal to convert a motor vehicle into a race vehicle if the emission system is changed from its original configuration. According to the EPA, this is an act of tampering. And if you've tampered, then you're subject to, if you're a commercial business, uh, fines of over $44,000 a day per violation. This new interpretation of the law had never been mentioned or put in writing. As we all know, racers have been converting race cars, motor vehicles, um, from the time they've come off the assembly lines for decades. As uh, we know, NASCAR incorporates um, that conversion policy, National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing. The proposed rule was issued in July 2015. No one had seen the language until SEMA discovered it last November, five months later. 
And then we spent two months trying to work with the agency behind uh, the scenes to convince the EPA that it was mistaken and here's an opportunity to step back. We were unsuccessful. We issued a press release on February 8th and to alert the public as to this position. The next day we launched a White House petition asking the EPA to withdraw the new policy. The public responded to the White House petition with 100,000 signatures in one day. SEMA then started with its allies on Capitol Hill on a permanent fix tape problem, the RPM Act. As we know, this was an election year, so there wasn't sufficient time for Capitol Hill lawmakers to approve the legislation and move it to the president's desk. But we are committed to getting the job done in 2017. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Russ, who will focus on the ramifications of this issue. Uh, they didn't give me a script, so I'll uh, just have to wing it. Uh, it's kind of an interesting situation we're facing with the EPA. Uh, Stuart mentioned that they came out of this rulemaking. It was part of a 600-page document dealing with medium and heavy trucks and greenhouse gases. And in the middle of it, they stuck about four or five lines that dealt with our industry. So you have to understand that they recognized going in that this was going to be a problem. Um, right after that, uh, Stuart and, and Steve put this petition out and got 1,000, uh, 100,000 names in 24 hours. As soon as that happened, they started a completely different approach, saying, wait a minute, we never intended to go after racing. I mean, people convert street vehicles into race cars. Even though that's the law, we have the authority. We don't intend to deal with that. And they would, then went to the Hill to suggest to everybody that the legislation we were pushing wasn't necessary. The problem had been solved. And most people, and we're hoping that you'll help clarify this, realize that our problem is solved, let's all go home. The problem is, is that the, uh, the legislation, do I need a mic? Yeah, I don't think you can hear me. I'm sorry, you can't hear me? Now I've got my hearing aids turned Oh, you want to come up here? No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. In any case, the, um, in any case, the problem we have with the act not is, is not with race cars. Uh, I have three cars that were converted from from street vehicles. Better? Yeah, I could have come back there though a little time. Um, in any case, I converted I've converted three street cars to race cars, and so I'm waiting for them to lock me up any moment. The real problem that we have with this, however, is that part of their policy is that if you are selling parts like the parts that are sold principally at the SEMA show that are intended solely for competition and are used solely for competition, but they actually could be, regardless of how they're intended to be used, they could be used on a street vehicle. Those products are illegal for sale and use in the United States unless they have an EO from the California Air Resources Board. And by the way, if you can get an EO for a, a part, you're not going to use it on a race car. You're trying to improve performance beyond, obviously, the original part. So as a consequence, our problem is this is a, a serious threat to the entire industry. And what we're doing now, and as Steve mentioned, we are, um, we're, we've sent a letter to the transition team, and an amazing thing happened on the way to the PRI show, and that was there was a national election. We have a different government coming in, and we feel there's going to be a different, different type of treatment of this. As a matter of fact, we've been in touch with the, with the transition team. We have provided them, or actually we're providing a little bit later, a white paper that's going to go directly into the transition teams for the EPA. And what we're asking them to do is support our legislation in the next Congress. So our hope is that we will actually have the, uh, the RPM Act uh, introduced in the Congress and, in fact, enacted and signed by the President of the United States, which would eliminate all this authority from the, uh, from the EPA. Another thing happened in that that I think most people are not aware of, because we're also taking another action. In the Act, it provided, they provided themselves the authority to go into any of your businesses, any businesses at all, without a warrant. It's a violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. In addition to that, they could go in there and require that you provide staff to them to assist them in their investigation, which is an unlawful taking, and require that, they, that you copy anything that they want. And they're not looking for a page here, a page there. They take hundreds of thousands of pages. That's a violation of the Fifth Amendment. So we're in the process now of preparing a case for the Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in Washington, D.C. to challenge the EPA on their unconstitutional activity. 
I, I, I have real confidence that we're going to win this, especially with the new administration. So we're hoping that by next year at PRI, we'll be talking about different things. Any questions? You bet. 30 years ago, you and I worked this same game with the California Air Resources Board when the Emission Control Act came and covered the entire country, cars, everything. How has it happened? How did, how did, it, how did it get un derailed, if you will, when the industry, same, the high performance industry, has been working both at the federal and the state level, especially California, working with the various government agencies in non-attainment areas to say, yes, we understand that. What comes out the tailpipe, we're going to clean that up. These EOs have been put into place. This industry has been working diligently and not trying to circumvent the, the public laws and, and agreed with the government. How the hell did this happen? I, I'm, I'm stunned that 40 years and 30 years worth of cooperation between the high performance industry and government has just evaporated like they've gotten instantaneously stupid. Actually, it wasn't instantaneous. It took a long time for them to get this stupid. Um, but if you but wonder four why... four lines in a big 600-page document. Right? It's, it's a duplicity. That's basically what it is. And that's the way things are working in Washington now. We actually have a pretty good relationship with the EPA in terms of dealing with these things. If you go and talk to the enforcement people, they will tell you that SEMA is, has been the most effective help in making sure we do not have defeat devices on, on the public roads. We've been doing that. The reason they did this is it's easier to enforce the law. Take it one step further. If they simply precluded all aftermarket parts, they simply said you can't sell aftermarket parts, think how easy it would be to enforce the law if you sold an aftermarket part. Definitionally, you violated the law. That's essentially what they've done here. They've made it easier for themselves to enforce the law even though they have sufficient authority to go after defeat devices. So the whole thing was basically to make it easier for people in the government who simply have no concept of how to prosecute cases. Simple as that. It's in prejudice. I used that word once too. Is, is the RPM Act more of a clarification language in its, or is it more of a changing? What, what, the, what the RPM Act does is it simply goes in and, and makes clear by an act of Congress that the Congress, that the uh, EPA does not have the authority to regulate racing, racing vehicles, or racing parts, regardless of where they came from. If they're used solely for competition, it's beyond the authority of the EPA, and that's what it will do. Thank you. In, to that end, racing is what less than one percent of the mobile sources that would contribute to the non-attainment in a specific area. I mean, I think when we first did this, it was mobile sources in itself of high performance was a single digit number. And racing has to be considerably smaller, in considering all of the mobile sources which would take into account all the highway vehicles, the trains, boats, all of that are mobile sources opposed to stationary. I, how, I, I'm just I'm stunned that they actually have got this to the point where they've got you three sit standing up here. I'm, I'm just amazed. Well, again, we've been working with this specific group of enforcement people for seven years on the issue of racing parts and what are defeat devices and how to deal with them. And then without telling us anything, by the way, including last year at the SEMA show, uh, they didn't tell us that they had done this in this rulemaking. So they basically slipped this into an act and tried to get it by, I assume, feeling that we wouldn't find it, which, of course, we did. And, um, and if you're looking for good sense, you gotta go someplace further than the government. So, uh, you know, that's, that's just a truism. So all the goodwill and the cooperation that SEMA has put forward has, it, it has amounted to nothing, essentially. Uh, I think that's, that's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. We do have, I, I will say, we do have a very good relationship with the Air Resources Board. We've now established a new program of getting EOs for, for our products. It's a much shorter process. Uh, we have, well, essentially what we have done in short is we have taken over the responsibility of the manufacturer. We take their parts. We have bought cars that we have greened that are required for the testing purposes. We have a full-on emissions laboratory at the SEMA garage. So we take the product, we fill out an application ourselves, get a quick approval from the Air Resources Board. It doesn't take two years to get that anymore. We get it sometimes in four hours. 
and then we do the testing, we put the package together, send the package into the Air Resources Board, and get the EPA, or the, uh, the EO from the Air Resources Board. And as I, you may be aware, once you have the EO, that product is now not just legal for sale and use in California, it's legal for sale and use throughout the United States. So SEMA has gone a long way to streamlining this, and I think we have a really, really good relationship with, uh, with the Air Resources Board. Russ, I would add to that that uh, we need to uh, have a distinction. That... Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> this is a battle with the EPA, not with California. So the EPA has effectively created a 49-state rule. California takes a different approach. So they recognize that race parts, race cars are not directly regulated. And, and so we don't have an issue with California. In fact, they give guidance for our, our companies, the distribution chain, that you should be marking your parts for race use only, something similar to that, and monitor your sales. So they distinguish between this. We've gone to the EPA and, and said, hey, California doesn't have the same approach, and get no response. How would the uh, RPM Act affect the EPA's uh, ability to go into shops that a warrant, like you discussed? Well, that's that's a separate matter. Okay. You're bringing a case that any type of challenge to the uh, EPA's authority overall goes to the Circuit Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, which is like the number two court in the United States. It's just below the Supreme Court. So we're going to file a petition um, very, very soon, uh, which would basically challenge uh, their actions, which we believe, and everyone we've spoken to believe, are uh, violations of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments to the Constitution. Uh, we're hopeful that the next administration, when, view, when viewing this act against the EPA, will say they agree with it, and they'll take a walk, and we'll win. By the way, uh, SEMA sued EPA three times. We never lose, so we don't want to start now. <laughs> By the way, I got an email last night, and um, Again, we're dealing with people on the inside of the transition team who are very, very interested in this issue. It's a clear case of, of over-regulation, which is something the administration is deadly opposed to. It hits small businesses and the rest of us in that way very much what they're opposed to. And so what I got back was a, um, they said they need an internal document, which we're in the process of sending, uh, to include the, in the uh, EPA uh, transition book. It looks like we can make this happen. So things change in a hurry in Washington. How can small businesses help? Well, the very first thing is to become familiar with it and then have as many people as you can write letters in uh, to your members of Congress because we're still seeking additional members to be sponsors and co-sponsors. We're absolutely convinced that if we can get it through the Congress that the President will sign it. There's no, uh, there's no question in my mind, and I think the transition team seems to enforce that. So what we need is to get the legislation introduced with the new Congress and, and either go through committees or if we can skip committees, I'm not sure where we are, if we can skip committees, then get it passed as soon as possible and uh, then send it to the White House for signature. So we need people to respond, to get in touch with their members of Congress. It's not just letters. Visit them. The most important thing you can do is visit because they realize that you can do that just inadvertently. That took some effort, so you must be pretty serious about the, the action. Call them on the telephone. Send texts, send emails, send letters, whatever it happens to be. Because all of those things mount up, and the members of Congress pay attention to them. How do you guys feel? Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, the governor of this state is actually Mike Pence. And he's been to this show before. He's very familiar with this industry. Uh, we've been in contact with his office as well so that we can sort of encourage him to act as a behind-the-scenes force to encourage the administration to go forward quickly with the bill. So we, as best position as we can be, we feel we are we're at that place right now in ways that we weren't uh, last year or this past year. How do you guys feel about the appointment of Scott Pruitt as the administrator of the EPA? He's the Oklahoma Attorney General prior. I really think it would be inappropriate for me to do my happy dance right here, but my happy dance will tell you how much we're impressed by that appointment. 
Uh, he's a person to start off with who is very much uh, interested in, in small business and the types of issues we, we're dealing with, very much opposed to overregulation. He is uh, one who does not believe in the climate change uh, philosophy, and so it'll be interesting to actually employ some science in that as it goes forward. We're very excited about, uh, about his, his uh, pending appointment. Thanks. Russ, can I hijack this for a second to answer this fellow's question? Certainly. You said about small businesses what Russ told you about writing letters. So I'm involved with Save the Salt. Y'all are aware of what's going on in Bonneville. We had a local committee guy show up. We did a thing with the racers. Showed them what was going on at Bonneville. This fellow put a piece of legislation in the House of Utah. It was in two committees in the Senate and the House, just like we have in Congress in Washington. Every time it went to one of those committees, we mobilized the racing community, the land speed racing community, to contact them and say, please support this. Long story short, each committee in the House and the Senate, and then when it went to the floor of the Utah House, it was passed almost unanimously. And it went right to the governor. He signed it, which then went right to the um, BLM, Neil Cornsey. That's the level of effectiveness. These legislators in Utah recognized that this was an important issue, not just to the racers at Bonneville, but to the people of Utah. So if that thing that happened in Utah could happen on a national basis for the RPM Act, it, he'd do his happy dance every day. We're, uh, we have to close up soon, but I'd like to follow on that. This was to deal with RPM, but let me tell you briefly about, uh, about the uh, Bonneville Salt Flats. Bonneville Salt Flats are in serious danger right now of being eliminated and it is directly the result of the Bureau of Land Management. They are solely responsible for the destruction of a national landmark. So we're going to have legislation, and we're also dealing with the transition team on this, we're going to have legislation that's going to force the BLM to restore the Bonneville salt flats. And we hope you'll support us in that as well. Has the current EPA leadership ever suggested how they would enforce the regulations on converted race cars? What they've said is, is that it's not their intention to go ahead. In other words, what they said is, the law is you can't convert street vehicles, but we're not going to enforce that law. It's a little unusual for a federal agency to say, there is a law. It's a law we're supposed to enforce, but we're not going to enforce it. The reason they did that is they realized there's no way to enforce it. I mean, how would they come after my three cars? I mean, it just, I mean, it's, it's an impossibility from an enforcement standpoint. Therefore, they said, we're not opposed to racing, we're not going to enforce this against racing, and, and a lot of people felt that solved our problem. What we're trying to demonstrate to you, it doesn't. It's the parts issue that's, that's a problem. They still have the authority to come after me and my three cars, but I don't think they're going to do that. But will they go after manufacturers like they are right now? They're all over the country going after manufacturers. I don't know if you're familiar with the enforcement actions. So the point is, is that they will be increasingly going after the manufacturers of parts, people in our industry. And by the way, not just the manufacturers, the distributors, retailers, and they have the authority to go after me as well. I just don't think they're going to do that. How about service providers? Can they go after them as well? People that would help service the cars? Sure. Hey, Steve, do you want to take questions off the site? Do you want to take some questions off to the site? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to have to close this down because I think our time is, is done. But uh, thanks for everybody for coming. If you have additional questions, we'll be here for the next half hour. Thank you.